I want to speak with you this morning from Psalm 108, which I imagine may be one of your favorite psalms because it is about the valiant people of God praying for victory from the very first moments of the day. Before I read this psalm, I just want to point out that this is a psalm that is actually a recombination of two other psalms. The uh, opening uh, five verses come from Psalm 57, and the concluding verses come from Psalm 60. You can look it up in your own Bibles. Uh, you can see that connection. I imagine this is a little bit like when you have um, a lot of dishes of food in front of you, and you take your chopsticks and you take a little bite from one of the dishes, combine it with a little bit of food from another dish to make a new combination of flavors. And that's what this psalmist did, taking two different psalms of David, combining them together to give a new flavor for our praises and for our prayers. And I'll say more about the context of this psalm in a little bit. Uh, but notice as I read the way it moves from praise to petition, and hopefully this morning those are both things that you're going to experience. Praise for God expressed through song and also heartfelt fervent intercession for the needs of the people of God. Here's how the psalm goes. My heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing and make melody with all my being. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great, above the heavens. Your faithfulness is, reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. That your beloved ones may be delivered, give salvation by your right hand and answer me. God has promised in his holiness with exultation, I will divide up Shechem and portion out the valley of Sukkoth. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim is my helmet. Judah, my scepter. Moab is my wash basin. Upon Edom, I cast my shoe. Over Philistia, I shout in triumph. Who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? Have you not rejected us, O God? You do not go out, O God, with our armies. Oh, grant us help against the foe, for vain is the salvation of man. With God, we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our foes. What a beautiful psalm. And what a beautiful expression of hope for the people of God. This is Psalm 108. It comes towards the end of the Psalter in what we know as Book 5 of the Psalms. You may know that the, the biblical Psalms are divided up into five sections. And Psalm 5, generally, is the Psalms that the people of God wrote and read and sang during and after their captivity in Babylon. This is later in the history of Israel. It's at a time when they uh, were discouraged about some of the things that they had suffered because of their sin, but also were filled with hope because God was rebuilding their nation. I find so many things here that are relevant for your prayers as the people of God this morning, and really for the prayer of any believer who's up early in the morning uh, to sing God's praise and to come before God in prayer. You might think of this as a warrior's morning song. That might be a good title for this psalm. Or you might think of it as a prayer warrior's morning song. Uh, here is a psalmist who is up very early. He's up so early, he's not waiting for the sun to wake him up. He's waking up the sun. And in a way, as you gather so early on a Saturday morning, that's what you're doing. And from the very first moments of the day, the psalmist is wanting to sing God's praise. That will, that's what we find in the opening uh, verses. He's wanting to have music from the very first moments uh, of the day. 
And he is wanting to praise God for some of his, his marvelous works, particularly his steadfast love, how constant, how faithful God is in his love. And let me just say, you know, as a pastor, when I'm teaching the Bible, I'm always thinking about the needs of the people of God. And maybe you this morning need a reassurance of God's love for you, for your loved ones. Uh, maybe this has been a spiritually dark time for you. This is a good way to begin the day by remembering that God is steadfast in his love. He never changes. Even if we go through lots of ups and downs in life, face all kinds of difficulties, God is steadfast in his great love. And that's part of the psalmist's praise. He's up at the very beginning of the day. I, I love the, what, what he does here in verse 5 because he's trying to celebrate God, praise him for his greatness. And so he, a lot of times when we think about how great God is, we think about creation, and that's what the psalmist does. He, he looks up to the heavens, maybe the sun is just beginning to rise and shine its light on the early morning clouds, and he says God's faithfulness reaches all the way up to those high places. And then in verse 5, he says, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. He wants to lift God up as high as he possibly can be lifted up. And as you gather for prayer this morning, remember that God is on his throne, that the Lord Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, is seated at the right hand of the Father. He is in that place of absolute exaltation, worshipped by angels, worshipped by the saints of all ages, worshipped by you, the people of God, as you gather for prayer um, this morning. Here is a psalm of elevation and exaltation to praise and worship God. In verse 6, the psalmist shifts from praise to petition. I want to point out, I have so much I would love to teach you about this psalm, uh, but let me just say a few of the things I, I can say in the time we have this morning. I mentioned earlier, this is um, a psalm combined of two other psalms. Um, I compared it to maybe two bites of food that you combine into one. It's, it's maybe a bit like um, a blanket that a seamstress would make where she takes a piece of fabric from one old blanket and a piece of fabric from another old blanket and stitches it all together to make something new. One of the interesting things is that when the psalmist who put together Psalm 108 took part of Psalm 57 and took part of Psalm 60 and put them together, in both cases, the psalmist took the end of of those psalms. And if, if you know how the psalms work, a lot of times you, you have a lot of questions or difficulties early in a psalm, but you reach a place of confidence and resolution at the end of the psalm. Now, one of the reasons that this psalm is so strengthening and hope-giving is because it takes the triumphant conclusion of two different psalms, puts that together in one psalm, and you get even more um, encouragement from it. I should probably just say a word about the, the context of these two different psalms. In Psalm 57, uh, David was um, at a time of crisis. He was being pursued by his enemy Saul, and he was hiding in a cave and fearing for his life, and yet still in that moment experiencing God as a refuge and a place of safety. If anything, Psalm 60 was written at a time of even greater difficulty because David had been up fighting with his armies in the north. And while he was in the north, he had been attacked by enemies, Edomites from the south that had laid waste to his armies. And so the people of God in those days had really suffered a defeat, not a victory. And David was, was wrestling with that. One of the reasons that's important for us is because this is a battle-tested psalm. It's an expression of praise and prayer by a man and by a nation who had suffered great difficulty and hardship and, and even defeat. And when you get to the petitions in the second half of the psalm, you, can, you get a sense of how difficult his circumstances were. Let me just give you one example of that that comes from the end of this psalm. In verse 11, um, David raises a question. It's a question he had when he wrote Psalm 60, and then it's also a question the people of God had when they put together Psalm 108 um, during and after their time of captivity in Babylon, and they said, Lord, you've rejected us. Haven't you rejected us? They, they put it as a kind of rhetorical question, um, but the answer is, you know, that's really the way we feel. We feel like God is not going out with us. You do not go out, O oh God, with your armies. 
I wonder if there are ever times when you feel as if God is not with you, that he's turned away from you. That's what the psalmist is wrestling with here. And we have to admit, there are many great evils and difficulties in the world today. Um, in Korea, you're living in a divided nation. I know the heart that people in South Korea have for their sisters and brothers in North Korea and a desire for reunification. We're seeing war in Europe, and, the, and we're seeing huge numbers of refugees from Ukraine, but not only from Ukraine, there are 60, 70 million refugees in the world um, today. And there are many conflicts and trials and turmoils in many different places, and you may be experiencing it in your own life. Um, if it was hard for you to come to prayer this morning because you were feeling discouraged, discouraged because you have a beloved son or daughter who's not following the Lord, discouraged because there's a conflict in your, in your community, discouraged because you're not sure how God's going to provide for your needs, discouraged because you feel like Satan is really attacking you and trying to drag you down and discourage you, you're in the right place this morning because here's a word of God for you and for all the people of God where we can be honest about what we're going through, where we can bring that before God in prayer and experience his blessing and his powerful work. Because at the same time that this psalmist is honest about his discouragements, the psalmist still has a strong confidence in God and in his sovereignty. And really, you see that all the way through the psalm. But let me just point out, um, I don't know how well you know your geography of ancient Israel, but there are a lot of places that are mentioned in verses 7, verse 8, verse 9, verse 10. Some of these are places inside Israel. One of the really interesting things, and I think relevant for you in Korea, is that God is claiming his sovereignty here over the parts of Israel that are on one side of the Jordan River and the parts of Israel that are on the other side of the Jordan River. The place names are not irrelevant. They're actually very significant. The psalmist is saying God is the Lord of this entire nation. I know that's what you believe about Korea. It's even in your archi the architecture of your church that this is one nation that is meant to be united. And we live in hope for the day when God will bring uh, Korea back together. And that's true not just in Korea, but all over the world. God is sovereign over all the nations. He's in control of the whole thing. And particularly through Judah, his chosen tribe. It's very significant here, isn't it? That at the end of verse 8, when God is talking about the different parts of Israel that are his, he refers to Judah as the scepter. That's the, the royal rod that a ruler would hold that demonstrates his kingship. He's sitting on his throne. He is holding his scepter. And when anyone sees that royal person, they have to say, no, that's the king. The king is on the throne the king has the scepter of his rule, and the king for the people of God comes from the tribe of Judah. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's one of those prophecies that is pointing us forward toward uh, Jesus Christ and his sovereign rule over the nations. There's something else I just have to tell you about, really about this psalm and every psalm. When we read the psalms, we should think of the author of the psalm like David. We should think of the nation of Israel, maybe in this case, in the times later in their history, uh, after their exile in Babylon. But we should also think about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in, in the book of Hebrews chapter 2, uh, the Son of God says to his Father, in the midst of my brothers, I will sing your praises. And, and the Apostle Paul uses a similar expression in Romans chapter 15. It's just a reminder for us. When the Lord Jesus Christ was in his earthly ministry, he sang these psalms. He sang them when he went to the synagogue. He sang them with his disciples. We know he sang a psalm on the night that he was betrayed before going to the Garden of Gethsemane. He was in the psalms. And we know from his words on the cross how, how richly he understood the psalms. So I think it's important for us as we read the psalms today and as we sing them to remember that the Lord Jesus Christ sings these psalms with us. He sings them with his brothers and sisters and so when, uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ takes these words from Psalm 108, he's claiming his sovereignty over the nations, his desire to sing God's praises with people from all nations. Um, this is God's plan and purpose through Jesus Christ. It's, it's the redemption 
of the nations. You know, when we, when we have an opportunity to give this kind of praise and to offer these heartfelt petitions, I think we end up in a place of strong confidence like the psalmist did at the end of this psalm. When you say to the Lord, O oh Lord, grant me help against the foe. Grant us as a church, as the church in the world, victory over Satan, over the evil one. There's no salvation to be found in any human being. It's only any human being. Salvation is only to be found in God and in his son, Jesus Christ. And we have the confidence of verse 11. We're not going to do valiantly in ourselves, but with God, we will do valiantly. He will tread down our foes. He's promised to do it in Jesus Christ, who will crush the serpent's head. I hope and pray for you this morning as you support the worldwide work of the gospel, and, and I hope pray for Wheaton College while you're praying for the world, um, that you will experience this kind of hope and confidence in the victory and sovereignty of God. God bless you as you go on with your praises and with your prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.